Okay, so um, good evening, everyone. So let's get started. Um, this is what I'll be covering tonight, and I know the title is quite a mouthful, but um, we can dissect server-side and Minecraft later on. Let's begin with just procedural generation. It is to algorithmically create more data, and for today, I'll cover Minecraft world generation, which is about generating the world on the right over there. Or, yeah, the right. <laughs> Um, the point of this is to create more content with high variability with less human input. And this does involve quite a lot of design work, though I'll cover less of that today. Um, the images is just um, a procedural tree, a procedural piece of art, I guess, yeah, and um, procedural dun dungeon generation. Yep. So this is our goal for tonight. It would be to generate something like this, but with as much algorithmic variation as possible, so with as little hard coding, if you will. Uh, yeah, if we were to flip this into a 2D graph, let's say to ignore the z-axis completely, we will be able to plot a 2D diagram of what we'd like to do. Yep. So let's talk about the exact tools that we're going to use to achieve that. Minecraft is a voxel game, which means it primarily consists of cubes. That means it's not this, but it is this, right? So it is a voxel game, the cubes, and that's, a, that's my skin I drew that six years ago, I think. And it is also a sandbox game, which, it, which means players are thrown into an infinite procedural world in order to survive in it and do essentially whatever it is that they want. For gameplay and rendering reasons, Minecraft will split its infinite world into chunks. So one chunk is a, like a 3D array of 16 by 16 blocks with full vertical height. And one block can be anything, really. This example there points to a leaf block on a tree. But in the chunk, you can also see wood, dirt, grass, stone, etc. It can really be anything. And part of procedural generation is to come up with a pipeline of some kind in order to create a chunk in a way that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so chunks are generated as players explore the world. I'll just replay that to kind of nail that in in a sense. So as the player explores, the pipeline will generate more and more chunks. So we don't actually know which chunks come first, nor do we kind of know where the player is going to explore next. We can't kind of predict where the structures are without writing something to do that for us. And there is an inbuilt procedural pipeline inside vanilla Minecraft that will, that will generate things chunk by chunk. As a side note, vanilla Minecraft refers to the unmodified base Minecraft game code. So whatever you get when you download the game from Minecraft.net. And tonight we'll use a Minecraft server to override this pipeline with our own code. So something like that, yeah. Specifically, we will use a Minecraft server like Paper. So Paper is a community-driven project which wraps the vanilla Minecraft jar file and gives us an API to work with um, to interface with Minecraft in a way that's a bit more stable and maintainable. So yeah, um, Minecraft is, we're talking about the Java version of Minecraft, not the C++ version. So most of what we'll be working here to, with tonight will be in Java. To be very, very, very clear about what the API is, let's try to narrow down who is what exactly. This on the left is native Minecraft or vanilla Minecraft, and that on the right is developers, people who seek to write some code to interface with Minecraft in some way. Uh, for tonight, we are trying to write world generation code, but in reality, this could be anything. Maybe you, I want to make players fly faster or higher, give them potion effects, whatever it is. Um, server plugin developers can code it in some way. So Minecraft's code base is obfuscated for legal reasons. So if you're an extremely skilled developer and you know how to untangle that, you could write a plugin, but it would hurt quite a lot. So what pa how paper comes into this picture is that it is a community jar file that will kind of build off vanilla Minecraft and 
It also contains community code, which helps to abstract this obfuscation away from us so we don't have to deal with it. And this is the API that we are actually dealing with tonight. Okay? And that leads us to the combined constraints that we must work with in order to generate our world. So first off, it might seem obvious, but try to use the API as it's intended. However, it's a bit limited and sometimes we will have to code many things from scratch. That will be a problem later on. When designing our terrain, we cannot make them as large as um, how they would appear in real life, for example. Blocks in Minecraft roughly translate to be about a meter large, but the maximum vertical height is slightly less than 400 blocks. So you can't actually make like a real life-sized building, nor can you even make a real life-sized mountain. Uh, yeah, and finally, because of how the API is designed, we cannot easily use inbuilt Minecraft generation code. And this means that if we try to make a Minecraft world generation plugin, we end up completely overriding whatever was there. So it becomes very difficult to try and just make small changes. You end up destroying what was already there previously. Now, for the actual pipeline that we will be using, the API splits operations in two stages, each of which depend on the previous stage. So, we will first start by defining world heights, and then we will place surface blocks like grass, layer the bottom with indestructible materials, then we will place some caves, and then place some trees and buildings. So this is kind of how the pipeline will operate. Um, we don't have a guarantee of when these things are called, only that they will be called in order. For example, if I am on the populate stage on a certain chunk, I can guarantee that all the previous pipeline stages were executed for that chunk. Nothing else, nowhere else. So we'll essentially be working on one chunk at a time, at any moment. Yeah. Um, these are the actual Java method signatures. We wouldn't need to really remember them for now. I'll show you the code snippets and I'll explain them more slowly later on. Just note that world info will contain the world seed and we will use that for random number generation later on. This will be for reproducibility purposes. So the same seed will make the same world sort of stuff. And remember, this is our goal. We are trying to create something like this in the 2D plane, only in 3D because it's Minecraft. And as a side note, um, up is the y-axis in Minecraft. So this is the y-axis, this is the x and z-axis. It's different from what we did in NST math. It confused me in first year. Um, but yes, that is what we are going to be doing for today. We will first start with how to generate y with respect to x and z. We can describe height with respect to horizontal location by abstracting it as a sort of graph. In Minecraft, it would, look, it would be a three-dimensional graph, right, like before. But instead, let's just focus more on this 2D graph and just the height map, so just the red line. And you can kind of see where the red line goes and how it relates to that picture. Yep. And essentially what we want is a function that looks like so. The goal here is to produce a height map that looked roughly like that picture we have earlier without, determined, without like coding in exactly where each block is. So the x value should preferably span from negative infinity to positive infinity if we intend to generate as much as we'd like. We also want f to be deterministic, as mentioned before, so that because we want the same seed to produce the same world. This is for reproducibility reasons and debugging reasons, and sometimes people just want the same world. The most obvious starting point would be to use random numbers in some way, but if we were to just say each y is just this random number, we would get this terrain that looks extremely noisy. If you were to imagine these blocks were next to each other, it would be quite unplayable and it would look quite unsightly. This is because random numbers are discrete and they come out as white noise. The position of like a random variable on the left does not depend on any of the other values. So what we really want here is coherent noise, noise that kind of joins together like a smooth graph, like you've sampled a smooth graph 
and there are actual gradients that are, well, not like this. We can design our own coherent noise, perhaps like maybe blurring sparsely sampled random noise. We've also learned a couple of random techniques and graphics that we could kind of apply here. Or we could rely on the work on, of those that came before us. Let me introduce you to Alban and his beautiful GitHub repository. Seriously, without him, many Minecraft word generation projects would simply not exist. Thank you, Alban. This library produce, provides us with seeded noise functions that can create outputs that kind of looks like this. This kind of looks like garbage, but if you imagine the image to have an X and Z coordinate that kind of points this way, and if you take the brightness of each pixel in this image to kind of refer to height, then you can kind of see that this thing goes coherently up and down, like a top-down view of mountains. And these noise maps will be the basis of achieving procedural generation for our terrain. We can mess with um, wave parameters like amplitude and frequency like normal graphs. Um, for example, this is, like, this is called simplex noise. Sorry that I didn't say that out loud. Um, yeah, but simplex noise is like a graph function. We can treat it like a graph function and we can mess with its amplitude and frequency in order to mutate it. So if let's say this red line is generated with that code there, get noise. If let's say we feel like the height's range is a bit too large, we want it to be less steep, we can just divide it. If let's say it's varying too little, we want it to vary more, we can double its frequency or just increase it in some way. And, but one thing you notice about simplex noise is that it's really smooth. And even this doesn't make sense in Minecraft because it's cubes, right? But it, but you can still quite see it because it ends up creating this roundish looking shape if you view it from afar. So we don't really want that. We want the ground to look more realistic, more rocky. And a very common technique that people have come up with, with is a thing called fractal noise. So fractal noise is made by adding different octaves of noise together. And an octave in, the sen in this context means half the amplitude and double the frequency. So as you can see, those are the different octaves of the same function. And if we were to sum them all together, we would actually get a very rocky looking noise. And it's very convenient because it's um, faster in general com compared to just trying to create a different noise function. And nicely, this actually works with many different functions. If you try this in decimals and add sine waves together, you can actually get a bit of a rocky looking curve. So yeah, that's part of simplex fractal noise. And with that, we have roughly the basis for our generate noise code. We can now fill up the world with stone for every x and z coordinate for this h value that we've calculated with simplex noise. This will be the Java code that we actually write to do something like that. So we are given the world seed, which is in world info, and we will use this for generating our simplex fractal noise with our Burns library. For all x and z coordinates, we will calculate the height with respect to the x and z coordinates by throwing it into our noise function, and then we will fill up to that height with a for loop with stone. There are obviously more optimi optimized ways to do this, but this is just to kind of get the point of, across of what's actually happening in each step. And all this happens for one chunk at a time. But this ground can be improved further, right? Like we're talking procedural generation. Where's the mountains, the rivers, the seas? We want more variation. So let's talk about layering different noise functions together in order to make the land even more interesting. Consider that the same fractal function from before, and we shall use it as our base noise. Let's consider a second function. Let's say it's a normal distribution of some kind. It could be any function. But let's say we translate this upwards by one. Just by multiplying these functions together, we can now create a result that has a substantially taller piece of land. A similar strategy can be used for oceans. If we want infinite variation, we can just replace the bell curve with another noise function. Maybe I could just pick simplex noise again. Or maybe I can even use a sine wave if I want fixed distances between each mountain. Uh, the same strategy can be used for oceans, only the other way around. 
And with that, we can kind of knock out the first stage. Let's go on to the next stage. Generate surface is about putting the stuff on the top, really. So for this case, the grass and the dirt. But just here, we would begin to run in into some more problems as well. Minecraft contains several different biomes, like the desert, the, snow bi the snowy biomes, the badlands. And how do we decide where the biomes are? How do we decide whether we want grass at the top or we want sand or something else? And this is where we come to biome distribution, choosing where a location corresponds to. A very simple start to this would be to divide the world into heights. So the highest parts we can just declare are snowy, the middle parts we can just declare have grass, and the bottom parts we can just fill, we can just keep them as stone and fill the sea up to their sea level. And that would kind of give us a top-down view that kind of looks like this. We can see the snowy peaks, we can see the oceans, we can see the plains, and this gives us quite some nice variation already. But this isn't enough variation. Where do I put the deserts? Where do I try to make the trees? Do they just all concentrate themselves on the mountains? That's going to look quite bad. So let's distribute them even further. Let's make another noise function. This time, let's declare it to be temperature. We can generate another fu noise function and then use this yellow threshold to say that everything above this temperature is hot, everything below it is cold. And this is what we get if we go back to like the same X and Z chord pointing this way. We will get the hot zones and the cold zones. And if we layer this onto the main noise map, we now have two different parameters to work with biomes for, their temperature and their height. But why stop at temperature? Let's add another one. What about vegetation? Uh, heavily forested areas versus deserts or something. And we can layer that onto our biome map too. So now, for every X and Z coordinate, we have a temperature, a vegetation, and a height. And with these three parameters, we can begin distributing them evenly. We can use those values as array indices if we were to floor them or um, round them in some way. And if, if, if I, for example, if an X, Z coordinate is hot and lush, we can declare that to be a jungle based on two randomized noise functions. Not to forget, since we also have the height information, we now have three parameters to distribute our biomes with. We can use height in order to separate low areas with higher altitude variance, and this is one of the more basic ways to choose where all the biomes go, right? But of course, there will be drawbacks. It's too simple to be true. Every developer has their own secret sauce when it comes to biome distribution. There was even a fraud scandal one day when a developer was accused of stealing code because their biome distribution looked suspiciously similar to a Minecraft mod. But back on topic, um, this simple distribution technique can cause some noise effects, noise artifacts, right? As you can see in the picture there, there's like this really round snowy mountain area. You can see like a bunch of contours and in general, it's not very flexible to work with. Like if let's say I wanted to add one more biome, where would I place in the array? And it's also really tricky to control the size of each biome because it's kind of completely random. And many developers will eventually move away from di just distributing with purely noise. But I won't go through how they do it here because yeah, there's really a lot of ways. So while that strategy isn't the best, we have something that kind of works. And with that, we're done with the generate surface stage. Uh, for the next two, I'm going to, uh, for the next one, I'm going to briefly pass over it because it's just a bedrock. In Minecraft, you can break the blocks, and if you drop through the world, you die. So for gameplay reasons, we just layer the bottom with an indestructible material. Um, this has nothing to do with world generation in general. Uh, let's move on from that. So for caves, this is where. <laughs> Well, every developer really does wildly start to vary here because every developer kind of disagrees what a cave is supposed to look like. Um, but the same general ideas from noise maps can be roughly reapplied here. So let's say we try to carve a cave into a world. One possible way to do this is to sample and threshold 3D noise. So all I have to do is just point to a random location underground and say, is this coordinates uh, noise value less than zero? If it is, let's just make it air. And there you have a very simple noise cave. Um, this is an oversimplified explanation of how native Minecraft does things. And 
but it is very oversimplified to the point of being a little wrong. But in reality, 3D noise is extremely costly, it's extremely messy, and there's a lot of duct tape code to try and like wrap this together to try and get it functioning in a way that isn't horrible. And for many cases, developers actually begin to abandon this pure noise approach and start to do iterative cave carving. So what do I mean by iterative cave carving? Um, before we switch to discussing that, let's switch to a top-down view. So this will be a bird's eye view, the x-coordinates will be this way, and yeah. The blue chunk is the chunk that we can currently write in inside generate caves. And an iterative cave would probably have an algorithm that looks roughly like that. So it would pick a start location, that red dot, and then it would pick a random direction D. And then it would iterate until a condition is met, maybe if the cave is too long or a random condition to stop. So for every cycle, it will check if it can spawn an air sphere, like a circle, but 3D. And uh, <laughs> remember, it can only perform a write inside the blue chunk. So this gray sphere here, it doesn't actually do anything. Then this red dot will move forward, and then it will try to change the direction and carve again. And this time, because the circle overlaps with the blue chunk, it will take a piece out of the chunk and carve air instead. This is how the iterative caves work. And you just repeat and repeat and repeat until you get this noise, this wormy looking shape through the world. And yeah, only the red circles will apply to this blue chunk. This is what the chunk would look like after carving the air spheres. In practice, near, every nearby cave at a predetermined starting location will calculate its path and attempt to carve into the blue chunk, so this ends up becoming extremely slow. If for every red cave you add, every single chunk is going to be slower to generate. Minecraft has a bunch of caves that kind of work like this. They're, they're still there, but the newer caves work more like the first variant, the noise caves. And this is now what our world generation looks like with the caves and the noodle cave. Yeah, so that leaves us with the most iffy stage among all of them, populate. So let's shift back to the bird's eye view again. This is where the API limitations really, really begin to bite because easily nothing is provided. We will use populate to place things that may overflow into another chunk. So if let's say we wanted to place a tree at the corner of this blue chunk, it'll be all right. A rock will be all right. A big dungeon that's larger than the structure. There will be a limit to how we can place these things. And this will lead to quite a lot of complicated problems. This is normally where most developers start to break down and give up then because this is where it gets really, really horrible to deal with. Yeah, a lot of impure things will happen here. This is where people abandon the API as well. So for small things, there really is no issue. You just place the three, you move on with your life, all is well. We are given the coordinates of the blue chunk, right access to the blue and gray chunks. As long as our object is smaller than the chunk, all is fine. So this places, well, yeah, this is the Java code in order to place things. So we pick an X and Z coordinate within the blue chunk and then we find the highest grass block on that chunk in order to place a tree. That's a um, Minecraft API call. Yeah, this will generate a normal Minecraft tree. So this is kind of what we have now, a bunch of trees, some ores because it wouldn't be Minecraft without ores, you can't mine. And moving on, let's talk about the bigger structures. Yep, Ugh. we cannot ignore these because we're competing with vanilla Minecraft. So we, we, if we just choose to generate small things, they just wouldn't fit. So one of the answers to these is puzzle pieces. Let's split the structure into separate jigsaw pieces that each individually fit within their writable bounds. We can now say that this green piece's red side, right side must have this red piece. And by defining which pieces can go on which sides, we can deterministically determine how to reassemble this structure over and over again, like how we calculated our caves iteratively. I can even say that the blue and yellow pieces can, like the yellow and blue pieces, yes, the yellow and blue pieces can spawn on a green piece's bottom side, allowing me to vary the way the structure spawns. This is very powerful for generating procedural structures, and this is effectively how vanilla Minecraft does them. You can also make paths, you can apply different limits, and they get quite complicated quickly. But 
the infinite variation here is very creatively liberating, a bit, a bit tricky to work with in practice, as I'll discuss later. So now we just need to decide where to spawn this jigsaw set. There are many ways to do this, though many approaches are iterative in some way. For example, this blue chunk center, um, you can try and apply maximum likelihood estimation, actually, because you can have a function of where your structures are roughly going to spawn, with the bottom part of each function being the closest structure. So if we were to take the blue chunk as the white ball, you can just roll it off the hill and see where the nearest structure is. Yep. So once we know where a structure is where the closest structure is relative to the blue chunk, we are able to now identify where the structure pieces go. And for every piece in the structure, we will check if its center is within the populating chunk. And if it is, we'll just place it. For every nearby chunk, we're going to repeat this procedure. So if we were to actually generate every single chunk in order, we will eventually piece our structure together again. But remember, structures are extremely painful, and this doesn't even begin to cover just how painful jigsaws are to work with. To give you an example, this is an image of an existing structure within Minecraft. Imagine trying to pick a side for every one of these individual pieces, and it it's actually quite painful to work with as well, though the alternatives don't tend to be much better. And with that, we have enough technical tools to achieve our generation goal. Our goal is fully finished. And that's the bulk of what, and that's the bulk of what um, you need to begin writing a world generation plugin, really. And with that, um, that's it from me. Um, thank you for listening. <laughs>